Their weapon is a secret seduction technique. Their means, sex. Their traps caught hundreds of influential men, such as British Prime Minister John Profumo, French Ambassador Maurice Dijon, Fidel Castro Jr., even Adolf Hitler. They were all victims of the girls from a special NKVD department, a division involved in the most effective kind of intelligence, sex spying. For the first time, we're going to describe the seduction techniques that were used by the Soviet sex scout and reveal the classified names. Hitler's favorite actress was Olga Chekhov. Kat, a famous radio operator of the 17 Moments of Spring, was in fact a scout, Anna Kameva. All of them, as well as dozens of other women in the NKVD, were not known by their names, but by a unique number and were all called the Swallows. The secret department was created in 1937 under Stalin's order. The Soviet beauties were brought to Moscow for casting. The selection was made by a committee consisting of the best physicians, gynecologists, and psychiatrists. The head of NKVD, Nikolai Eshov, directed the casting himself. Out of hundreds of applicants, he had to choose 20 to be the first students of the Soviet secret school of sex intelligence. In six months, the best scouts of the USSR will leave this school resembling female robots, devoid of fear and complexes. It was like a production line with a single template, white-skinned, slim and sexy with a code number instead of a name, and with the nickname, The Swallow. Coming up next, the secret schools of sex intelligence in the USSR, the prostitute secrets and spies training, the methodology of the honey trap, the shocking instructions on how to seduce men, the sex weapon in the war of the world's intelligence services, how Marshal Tukhachevsky's fatal mistake initiated a Soviet sex espionage. In 1937, the Soviet Union undergoes Stalin's repression. Teachers, doctors, and military commanders disappear because of the NKVD. Every day, the intelligence agency's archives received hundreds of packages marked red. The case is closed. The sentence is execution. Mikhail Tukhachevsky came round as the icy cold was penetrating his body. The water made him regain consciousness. He couldn't see or feel a thing. His swollen body no longer responded to the assaults. Tukhachevsky lost track of time. The only thing that seemed to exist was this dark, damp room and some people asking him to sign some papers. He resisted for a while, but he eventually gave up. He did everything they demanded in order to stop the torture. The Czechists kept their word and stopped beating Tukhachevsky. He was shot the same night in the Lubyanka courtyard. The famous marshal, the Civil War hero Mikhail Tukhachevsky, never understood what he'd done wrong. In the evening before his death, he had signed a confession composed by the NKVD. He declared that he was recruited by a German spy. He wasn't able to read the document as he was almost blind by the assaults. Tukhachevsky died without knowing that he was betrayed by his own mistress. Josephine Hensi was a beautiful singer at the officers' club. But in reality, she was a German spy. Protégé of Admiral Canaris, the head of the German intelligence. She planned to recruit Tukhachevsky for the secret cooperation with the German intelligence service. 
but all she achieved was a sexual affair. The marshal was arrested before he could realize what had happened. But this didn't save him from an execution. Reading NKVD's report about the singer's underground activities, Stalin angrily remarked, she is a beautiful woman, a scout. She recruited Tukhachevsky and Karahan with her petticoat. She even recruited Yenukitsa. She had Rudzutak in her hands. In short, all the Red Army elite. This was an exemplary case, and Stalin first realized how valuable a sex-related intelligence could be. He decided that Germany deserved a similar response and started training women for professional sex espionage. The Soviet secret services added sexual espionage to their work. In the autumn of 1937, according to the orders of Nikolai Eshov, the head of the NKVD, the Soviet beauties, who had been carefully selected, were brought to Moscow. It wasn't difficult to find girls like that. The propaganda was impeccable, and many girls wished they could serve their motherland. Only the best would make it to the top 20. Besides beauty, the girls should have good health and strong nerves, and that was exactly what the special commission was going to check out. Gynecologists, therapists, and psychologists filled each applicant's forms. Due to my profession, I had to meet women from the sex industry. I should say, they all had a certain professional deformity. They are very obedient. You say go, and she goes. Stand, and she stands. Sit here, and she sits where she was told. A woman like that is used to satisfying a man's whims. But obedient wasn't all the sex spies had to be. They must look like docile, depraved women, but they mustn't forget about their job, not for one moment. That's why it was necessary to choose psychologically stable and uninhibited women, a real problem for the Soviet Union, who was under Stalinist repression. It was important to make the right choice. That's why the commission was led by the head of the NKVD himself, Nikolai Eshov. The People's Commissar was unbiased in his evaluation as he had a soft spot for men, a fact that was discussed in the government circles. Although Eshov tried to conceal his sexual preferences, his attempts had failed. When Eshov would be later removed from his post, he was accused of sodomy, terrorism, and espionage. As evidence, the court had the testimony of two of the commissar's lovers, the deputy chief of the Leningrad factory, Svitoch Ivan Dementiev, and the Red Army commissar, Vladimir Konstantinov. But Eshov wasn't officially condemned for his homosexuality, which Stalin could not tolerate. Due to fear of publicity, the verdict was adjusted to the spirit of the time. Eshov was shot as a spy and state criminal. He was replaced by a Stalin's ally, Lavrenti Beria, a Swan Lake and ballet dancer's lover. The selection of the Soviet Swallows was under his personal control, caring more about his own interests than of the state. Beria regularly forced singers or even schoolgirls to join the ranks of sex school intelligence. The audition took place in his bed. Somebody had to give sex lessons to the selected girls. Beria reasoned that the best way would be to find representatives of the most ancient profession. 
In 1938, in the midst of the repression, regular raids were performed on the secret brothels that existed under the disguise of sewing studios and apartments. The brothels were destroyed and the prostitutes were thoroughly examined and some of them were sent to Siberia, while others were released from custody to perform a very important state task. According to the law, the ladies of the night, being the class enemies, had to spend several years in strict regime camps. An exception was made for the most experienced girls. They became the sex mentors of the Soviet swallows. With the students and the teachers in place, the secret school started its first lessons. It's hard to believe that the sex spy courses that produced uninhibited and seductive women started at a time when a different image of women was promoted throughout society. The ideal Soviet woman has a coarse, ardent face with an inspiring look. Her job is to work, have children and carry out her duty to the society. She had to be dull and inconspicuous and, most importantly, asexual. While the majority of Soviet women denied their natural sexuality, things were different in the Moscow Lubyanka. The selected beauties were taught how to undress quickly. The swallows were sitting naked during the lesson. The education was split into three stages. The first was educational. During the first six months, the students should learn several foreign languages, etiquette, dancing, and expand their general knowledge. The goal was to be able to arouse their interlocutor's interest within reasonable limits so that their great intellect would become repulsive. The second stage consisted of three parts, the first being psychological treatment. They were led through their base instincts so that their spirituality would be numbed. The girls consciously served an idealistic aim. After the psychological treatment, these women were convinced that everything they were taught was for their homeland's sake. There is no need to analyze it using common sense. The second phase included exercises on sexual looseness and freedom from restraint. Every self-respecting Soviet man visited a public bath. People would willingly spend hours queuing. The Soviet swallows were also there, but they were brought in secretly during the special clean-up days. In a steam room, the NKVD men were waiting for the girls to wash together. Thus, the future scouts lost their shame and learned not to be bashful. After the testing in the bathhouses, the last phase of the second part of the training followed. The seduction of the stranger, with no intimacy yet, the NKVD organized bogus dates for the swallows. They showed a victim and let the girls go for one evening. If the future sex spy was able to interest a man and arouse his sexual desire, she passed the test and proceeded to the final stage of the training, the study of sexual prowess. In an autumn day in 1938, a special lesson was given to a small audience. The student scrutinized a naked man who stood in the middle of the audience. They only stopped looking in order to write in their notebooks. This lesson wasn't part of the Academy of Art. The naked man was not a male model for life drawing. 
He was the main sex tutorial for the Soviet Swallows, an NKVD officer. With his help, an experienced hooker teaches the girls how to make a man excited with just one touch and how to bring him extreme pleasure. All these recommendations were also published in a booklet, but the public never saw it. The brochure was only used in the sex spy school to train new swallows. These lessons were only being published in the early 90s. Former swallow Veronica made a sensational confession. By the time we finished our training, we had become cynical, sexually sophisticated girls. By the time we finished our training, we had become cynical, sexually sophisticated girls. Coming up next, the secret tricks of the Soviet sex spies. How did they seduce a man and make him reveal his secrets? We will disclose the contents of the secret NKVD sex manual, applied sexual lessons, orgies within the Central Committee, the first military flight of the Swallows. The mystery of the radio operator, Kat. How did Adolf Hitler become a victim of sex spying? They already know how to be relaxed and lascivious. They have thoroughly studied all the weaknesses of the stronger sex. They know all the erogenous zones and are able to pleasure them. They don't give way to their hang-ups. Now it's time to reveal the mystery of the seduction technique which got men talking without realizing it. How exactly did the swallows awaken such strong sexual desire in men? First, they prepared a mixture of herbs. Verbena, lavage and rue. Even at the time, it was scientifically proven that the combination of these three components awakens male potency. It happens on a subconscious level, regardless of the victim's will. This mixture has to be carefully rubbed on the skin, hair and clothes. If it wasn't possible to apply the herbs, the swallows used anything that was available, such as the secretion of their own sex glands, which they applied behind their ears. A man becomes completely helpless and follows the woman against his will. He will give anything just to possess her. This method worked flawlessly, except in certain situations such as when the client had a cold. If this was the case, the swallows had another weapon in their arsenal. Imipramine, cocaine in its pure form or mixed with alcohol. These cocktails enhanced sexual desire and also blunted the customer's attention as well as his memory. There was one more trick that the swallows used. They fished out the information they needed immediately after their client's orgasm, when the victim was relaxed and vulnerable. And as the psychotropic effect wore off, the man could not remember what he had told his temptress. If the client regained consciousness faster than expected and realized what was going on, the Swallows had a plan B. This was only applied when there was a direct threat to the mission. It was a secret technique used by the Kunoichi Japanese School. In the 16th century, Kunoichi, or poisoned flowers, was the name given to the temptresses who had special assignments at the imperial palace. These girls were perfectly skilled not only in the art of seduction, but also in 64 different ways to kill a man, such as with the use of a hairpin. 
The girl smeared the tip of the pin with poison that instantly paralyzed the enemy and killed him within minutes. Here is a small decorative umbrella, the favorite Japanese national dance accessory and the perfect lethal weapon. While dancing, the Kunoichi took a step forward, abruptly closed the umbrella and spiked the enemy's groin. Then they opened it again and hit the victim in the optic nerve located between the eyes. The man died instantly. This technique, also serving a different purpose, is based on the same skills and principles as acupuncture. In acupuncture, by pressing or puncturing the corresponding body spots, one can heal a person. On the contrary, the art of the Konoichi causes irreparable harm. The Soviet swallows were using this technique, but how exactly? These fragile women were actually masters of martial arts and could quickly and quietly disarm a man. I perform my mission. I have to disarm you and lay down on the floor. It hurts. The man can't stand up. His joint is blocked. And the man can only beg for help. Done. A man is on the floor, but he can still shout. How did they keep him quiet? There is a fovea near the trachea. Just press there with a the finger. Try to say something. It won't work. It's amazing. One touch and the throat feels as if it's clenched from the inside. It is incredibly difficult to talk. So it was possible to quickly and painlessly shut them up. It was the indulgence that Tatiana had done for us. One such action could make the enemy lose his voice. After that, you can do anything to him. Please, reveal at least one secret technique of the Kunuichi. How did they kill? They used their main weapon, temptation. They came close, they hugged the man, then upset the balance. The man is fixed. They either broke the cervical vertebra or took a poisoned stick and stabbed it into a vital point. Among those deadly techniques, the most refined was the so-called deadly bite. While kissing, the Kunoichi would bite the enemy's tongue out so that he would choke on his own blood. After a few seconds, he was dead. In fact, the Soviet swallows didn't need such skills. Their sex education was so good that failure was simply not an option. And if they disarmed their victims, they did it only in exceptional cases. The first Swallow courses finished in 1939. The 20 graduates were prepared for their first assignment. But they had to pass a final exam. They had to engage in group sex, which was also filmed. This was to make sure she could have sex without embarrassment. Her personal feelings had to be buried. 
Having sex needed to be separated from emotional feelings. Such ordeals were used to show that sex is easy and accessible, whether it be in a group with a man they didn't love. Using the video footage, the Swallows, along with their mentors, analyzed their errors for the last time. And only then were they set free. All the girls were slim and incredibly attractive, but devoid of emotions and feelings. The long months of training had turned them into female robots. They were perfect spies and skillful temptresses. These were the features of the first swallows who were sent to their new home, Nazi Germany. Soon these girls will become secretaries, maids, waitresses and even nannies. As planned, all of them will find a lover. They will change these lovers until they find the most influential, thus moving even closer to the German political elite. This operation was a successfully kept secret. The Third Reich had no idea about the existence of the Swallows. The sex espionage was only used for internal purposes. In the summer of 1939, the Berlin police received a telegram stamped secret, a matter of national importance. For the Reich's interest, it was ordered to quickly find among the prostitutes the 20 most beautiful and trustworthy. The directive was signed by Walter Schellenberg, head of the German intelligence service. The police quickly found the women they were looking for. The prostitutes had a short briefing, signed secrecy documents and were sent to the brothel. The Kitty Salon was the name of this public house. It was the most popular Berlin brothel at the time. The obliging hostesses showed the guests albums containing the girls' photos. Among them was a very special album. I'm a guest from Rothenburg. This would be the password for extra special visitors who would be given the best girl. The man was led into a room where the girl selected from the VIP album was waiting. The special guest didn't know that everything he did or said in this room would be relayed to the Third Reich intelligence. A man with secrets has to restrain himself. The more restricted he is, the more release he needs. Sex is the perfect way to emancipate oneself. That's why it worked. And man was constrained, burdened with the important secret. They just used an instrument that helped them relax, a woman with a microphone. This was the plan of the chief of the intelligence, Walter Schellenberg. The specially selected prostitutes would discuss with the relaxed clients political issues in an intimate atmosphere. These clients were also employees of the Third Reich. It was necessary to find out whether they were traitors preparing a conspiracy against Hitler and his associates. At first, all the VIP clients behaved the same way. They joked, laughed, talked about trivial matters. Or worse, praised Hitler and his entourage. This happened in most cases with some exceptions, such as Galeazzo Ciano, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy, and Mussolini's son, who paid the price for being too candid. Under Hitler's order, Ciano was executed as a traitor. Actually, the Führer just could not forgive the Italian's sharp remarks for him. Hitler seemed particularly offended when Mussolini's son-in-law,
called him an idiot in a conversation with the girls. While the Führer's supporters, together with the girls from the Kitty Salon, dug up dirt for each other and worried about internal security, the Swallows successfully carried out their mission for the Soviet foreign intelligence. The results surpassed all expectations. The Swallows learned about Germany's preparations to attack the Soviet Union. In the spring of 1941, the Berlin agent Alpha sent an extremely urgent message. Germany was ready to invade the USSR. Hitler's army would be divided into three groups, in three main areas, Moscow, Kiev, and Leningrad. This was the message of one of the Soviet swallows. She already had a two-year relationship with someone from the Reich Marshal Goring environment. The lover, who finally trusted the girl, began to reveal the secrets. But Stalin left the sensational news unnoticed. Though, when the war started, he began to consider the information coming from the swallows that were in the enemy's territory. The information about the secret activities in Hitler's den is still classified. Although we have some data. In 1973, Soviet television screened 17 Moments of Spring. Director Tatiana Lioznova's series was about the adventures of the Soviet agent Sturlitz and was a great success. Millions of viewers followed with bated breath the main character and his assistant, the radio operator, Kat. People's favorite, Kat, is actually a Soviet sex swallow and Lavrenti Beria's beloved. Her name was Anna Kamyeva. This woman's life story was the basis of the cinema adventures of the radio operator, Katrin Kin. The script presented her as the ideal wife of Edwin Kin, the German clandestine organization member and agent of the Soviet intelligence. In real life, Anna Kamyeva was not married yet and wasn't working with Sturlitz. She gathered all the information from high-ranking Reich officers, just as she was taught in the Swallow School. Her mission was fulfilled. History reveals a woman not related to the Swallows, but directly related to the sex espionage. Due to the outbreak of war in 1941, Lavrenti Beria ordered to reactivate an undercover agent of the Soviet Union in Berlin. In the early 30s, this agent was on the verge of collapse, so kept a low profile. Now it was time to get back to work in the heart of the Reich. Her name was Olga Chekhova. She was close friends with Hitler and his mistress, Eva Braun. The beautiful, talented actress wasn't one of the Soviet swallows, but she did use sex to serve her homeland. A spring morning in 1944. In Berlin, beside a small estate, a car stops. The uniformed armed men get out of the car and rush into the house. The Gestapo chief himself, Heinrich Müller, led this operation to capture a dangerous spy. He broke into the house and couldn't believe what he saw. Adolf Hitler was drinking tea with the German actress of Russian origin, Olga Chekhova. Müller suspected she was a spy for a long time, but he had no evidence. Therefore, he decided to torture her after her arrest. But he had underestimated Olga. An angry Führer sent the Gestapo away. 
Mueller's operation failed miserably. He didn't dare try again. The Reich knew that this woman had an enormous influence on Hitler. For her sake, he instituted the caption of the state artist of the German Reich. At her request, the Führer refused to destroy Olga's distant relative, the writer Anton Chekhov's memorial house in the occupied Crimea. During receptions, she sat next to Hitler and was the object of his constant attention and care. Olga had another influential admirer, Lavrenti Beria, the head of the NKVD. Using two different radio operators, she handed him information about Germany's strategic plans, such as the capture of Leningrad and Moscow, or the construction of an ideal society. In short, everything that could interest the Kremlin. She was a great USSR agent working in the German circles. And not only as an agent, but also a supplier of special top-secret information, as well as descriptions of personal characteristics of the Third Reich leaders. In 1942, Chekova organized Hitler's assassination attempt. The Soviet spy Yanuts Radzivil was supposed to kill him. The operation would have been a great success, but at the last minute, Stalin changed his mind. As it turned out, Britain and the US were just getting ready to sign a treaty with Germany for peace. Together, these countries could destroy the Soviet Union. The Kremlin knew that Hitler wouldn't accept such a treaty, but they weren't sure what his successor would do. That's why they let the Fuhrer live. The only person to suspect Chekhova was the Gestapo chief Mueller, but he never managed to expose Olga. In 1945, Hitler lost to the USSR and committed suicide. Chekhova died in 1982 of old age, outliving all her famous admirers. In 1945, the redundant sex spies from Salon Kitty returned to their original profession, prostitution. And the Salon became a quiet brothel again until its closure in 1994. Meanwhile, the Swallows returned home, where they continued to serve their country. a room in the in-tourist hotel. Since the Soviet Union, almost nothing has changed. The standard rooms, the same curtains, and a mirror on the wall. Nothing particularly suspicious. But behind the mirror, in a special room, a high-quality camera recorded everything that happened. This was the swallow's nest. The Soviet sex spies worked here from the end of the war until the collapse of the Soviet Union. At these hotels, the sex spies were after the diplomats, military officers, foreign engineers, and other high guests of the Soviet capital. The acquaintance always seemed to be random. The relationships led to a night of passion. The next day, some people in plain clothes came to the foreigner's place and showed the lover incriminating photographs and offered to help. In the Museum of the Foreign Intelligence Service of the Ukraine, there are two unique exhibits. The first is the legendary cryptographic machine Enigma. During the Second World War, it was the most effective way to encrypt information. The second exhibit is a Soviet spy's manicure set. It was used in several European countries. Inside the double lining, the spy hid her encoding tables. But after the war, this espionage weapon was handed over to the archive. But the hidden cameras, recorders and microfilms served the spies until the Union breakup. 
There were cases when the swallows needed to pass on vital films to the secret services. But how if, for example, the customer was standing nearby? It was important that he didn't suspect anything. That's why the following methods were used. Here is an ordinary chestnut. You'll find it in any park where chestnut trees grow. But this particular chestnut is a special device in which a microfilm has been placed. Is it inside the chestnut? Yes. Then the chestnut is left in a pre-arranged place. The person who is meant to receive it walks into the park and then picks it up, along with other leaves and chestnuts. The FBI agent Richard Miller, the French ambassador Maurice de Jean, the British intelligence officer John Vassallo, Sergeant US Army Glenn Roran, are just some of the victims of the Soviet swallows and foreign sex spies recruited by the KGB. The most scandalous was the case named Honey Trap for the British Prime Minister. 1963. Britain endures a deep political crisis. The whole cabinet retires. This event shocked the whole world. The ruling Conservative Party had to resign. All this happened because of the British Defence Minister, John Profumo. Or rather, because of his mistress, the spy Christine Keeler, recruited by the KGB. For two years, she handed over copies of British naval intelligence documents to Moscow. Later in her memoirs, she would write, Profumo had shown me his room many times. Sometimes we made love right there on his table, where the document stamped Top Secret lay. That's how the KGB got to know the exact whereabouts of British submarines carrying the ballistic missiles called Polaris. That's the way they tracked the movement of American nuclear warheads in Germany. At the height of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and America, this information was invaluable. The truth came to light when after a two-year romance, the Minister of Defense left his mistress. A furious Christine disregarded the Swallow Code and reported the affair to the newspapers. The next day, the British headlines read, In Bed with a Spy. Profumo sells secret information to the Soviets. No direct evidence was found to institute legal proceedings, so Profumo remained free. But his reputation as a politician was destroyed. Christine was less fortunate. Her confession put her in jail for six months. But the process was irreversible. The compromised Profumo took down the whole government. British ministers resigned. Soon, a six-page booklet was published in London and became a sensation. For the first time, the special KGB technique, the so-called honey trap, was described. The very trap Profumo had fallen for. The authors of the booklet stated that Profumo's mistress was nothing compared with the girls in Moscow. In 1985, a girl named Violet seduced Clayton Laundry, the guard of the US Embassy in Moscow. He wasn't that important, but he turned out to be invaluable. Laundry was stealing the US Embassy's secret documents and handing them to Violet. She then gave them to Uncle John, who was an agent of the Soviet intelligence service. Clayton also showed her the room in which important ambassadors' meetings were held. Inside this room, the KGB placed a listening device, which continued working for years. 
In the 60s, intelligence agencies would recruit sex spies made up of ordinary women. I had an acquaintance. She said that she had problems because the KGB forced her to date Fidel Castro's son and report everything they did. The system was well coordinated. Frightened women made reports, foreign visitors fell into the trap and shared information. It seemed that it was impossible to fail. But the KGB did not consider one thing. Some of the distinguished guests fell into those traps deliberately. In 1967, Moscow welcomed a special guest. To celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Great October Revolution, the Indonesian president, Ahmed Sukarno, came to the Soviet Union. He was famous for his generous nature and his love to the fairer sex. For the KGB, he was the perfect victim. The lovable head of state had chosen some pretty stewardesses and was happy when they accepted his invitation to stay overnight in his hotel room. Everything went according to plan. The orgy arranged by Sukarno was filmed by two cameras using the best American color film. In the morning, the president was shown the finished film. He watched in silence and then asked for a copy. Sukarno explained, when my people see this, they will be proud of their ruler. The KGB was puzzled. Such a failure had never happened before in the history of sex intelligence. But this case is probably an exception. In general, the honey trap technique functioned smoothly until the collapse of the Soviet Union. This technique exists even now, because there's still confrontations and every state has its own interests. The end justifies the means. The Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. But the security services remained, as did the special sex divisions and the documents stamped top secret. One of the most recent sex scandals involved President Clinton and his intern Monica Lewinsky. Also, the Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi was filmed in the sauna. We don't think these stories are related to the sex espionage, but the result of these scandals is to compromise the highest members of the government and create a sensation. The real sex traps are discreet, and their results affect not only the media headlines, but the world around us.